Multiple sclerosis, or MS, is a chronic disease of the brain and spinal cord that affects more than 400,000 Americans. Typically young adults in the prime of their lives. Two thirds of those affected are women, mostly people of Northern European ancestry. In this video, we will talk about our current understanding of the disease, what it does, and how it affects the functions of the central nervous system, that is, the brain and spinal cord. After describing what is MS, we will talk about how the disease is diagnosed, the different patterns of the disease, and what treatments are currently available. When I was newly diagnosed, I was very frightened. I didn't know what course the disease would take or how long the symptoms would last. I thought I had a death sentence. I started to read up on the disease. The unpredictability was what scared me the most. Any little symptom, whether it really is related to MS or not, gets your attention. You want a direct line to the doctor's office to air your concerns. Support from my husband and family was crucial and really helped me through my worries. I knew quite a bit about the disease since my mother lived with it for 40 years. The main thing I knew was that the disease affects each person differently. I remember when my doctor first told me that he thought I had MS. I called my husband on the phone and said something like, will you still love me if I have to use a wheelchair? I didn't know much about MS at all. I guess I was probably like most people. I thought that if you had MS, you automatically used a wheelchair. I didn't know that most people with the disease are not significantly disabled. I didn't know you could be like me, healthy, active, and physically strong. At first, I thought my life was over. As it turns out, it was just beginning. MS is an inflammatory disease of the central nervous system in which the body's immune system attacks healthy parts of the brain and spinal cord causing tissue destruction. The inflammation of MS occurs in patches, so not all of the brain or spinal cord is affected at once. These patches of inflammation initially affect the insulation around nerve fibers called myelin. Myelin is made by nerve cells called oligodendrocytes, or oligos. Since the central nervous system is an electrical organ, proper insulation of nerves is necessary for electrical impulses to be sent quickly and accurately from one point of the system to another. Loss of myelin, or demyelination of nerve fibers, occurs because lymphocytes, part of the body's immune defense system, cross the blood-brain barrier and enter the central nervous system. These lymphocytes are then stimulated by proteins in the brain and produce toxins that attack myelin. The myelin becomes damaged, and scavenger cells called macrophages strip the damaged myelin from the nerve fibers. When the myelin insulation is destroyed, Nerve impulses take longer to reach their destination and in some instances are blocked. When this happens, particular functions of the brain and spinal cord may be interrupted. As the toxins and macrophages continue to destroy myelin, the underlying nerve fibers become exposed and they themselves are eventually cut.
People often ask if myelin and nerve fibers can be repaired. To a limited extent, they can be, but only after the inflammation has subsided. Oligos try to form new myelin layers. However, in areas of inflammation, oligos don't grow and often will die. As a result, formation of new myelin is very reduced and often absent. Nerve fibers that have been cut cannot regrow. If the inflammation in MS lesions is very intense, there is little if any regeneration and permanent scars are formed. These scars are called plaques. MS is a very complex and variable disease. And because it can affect any part of the central nervous system, each individual's symptoms are unique. It's been my experience that most people, when they hear the term MS, have an image of wheelchairs and significant disability. And while this can certainly happen, it is relatively uncommon. In actuality, most people with MS have mild to moderate changes in their ability to function and can lead relatively normal lives with normal lifespans. In addition, with the advent of treatments for MS only available in the last decade, the course of MS can be significantly altered for the better. In every instance, early diagnosis and treatment are critical. There are four general patterns of disease in MS. The most common pattern is one of attacks and remissions. This pattern is called relapsing remitting MS. In this pattern, an individual will have the fairly sudden appearance of a new symptom, often within hours to days, with gradual improvement over days to weeks. Since MS can affect any part of the central nervous system, the number of symptoms that can occur is quite large. They can range from changes in vision, to feelings of numbness and tingling, to difficulties with strength, balance, and coordination, to changes in bowel, bladder, or sexual function. The second pattern of MS is called secondary progressive MS. This pattern gradually develops in about one half of individuals who originally had relapsing remitting MS. In secondary progressive MS, a person no longer has sudden attacks. Instead, there is a gradual and continuous progression of neurologic change. We don't know why the pattern of disease changes in this way, but we do know that persons with this pattern do not respond well, if at all, to treatments that have a reasonable effect on relapsing remitting MS. The last two patterns of MS are the least common, primary progressive MS and progressive relapsing MS. These patterns occur in only 10 to 15 percent of persons with MS, and unlike relapsing remitting MS, are seen in individuals in their middle years, with equal numbers of men and women affected. The pattern of primary progressive MS is one of very gradual onset of neurologic change, often affecting the legs, with increasing difficulties over years and decades, and no sudden attacks or relapses. In progressive relapsing MS, onset is gradual, with an occasional acute attack. I have a chronic progressive type of MS with a relatively low slope of increased disability over time. I've now lived with MS for about as long as I have lived without it, and have learned to cope pretty well. MS is affected the strength in my right leg, I walk with a limp, but generally get where I need to go. The good and bad days that I have are largely psychological. Sometimes I feel sorry that I cannot do some of the things I would like to do, but who can do it all? I know that if it were not for the support of my wife and children, there would be far more dwelling on the negative 
than the positive and a much less fulfilling life. No symptom or sign is unique to multiple sclerosis, and diseases that can mimic MS must be ruled out before a diagnosis of this disease can be made. When I first went to the neurologist, he did not diagnose MS for sure. He only said that it was a possibility. He eliminated some possibilities by doing a spinal tap. The MRI didn't show MS to an absolute certainty, but the doctor gave it an 85% chance. My most memorable feeling was pissed off because I have always taken very good care of myself. Five years later, my husband and I were reading about MS treatments, and he suggested that I get another MRI to be absolutely certain that MS is what I had. They read the MRI and confirmed the illness. Because of the difficulty in diagnosing someone with MS, it is important to obtain as much objective evidence as possible. There are many individuals that have symptoms suggestive of MS, but in the absence of objective findings showing the presence of patchy brain inflammation, a diagnosis cannot be made. Objective findings include a neurologic exam, MRIs of the brain and spinal cord, blood tests, and testing the spinal fluid. In order to be diagnosed with MS, an individual must exhibit all three of the following. A progressive inflammatory disease of the central nervous system, involvement of different areas of the central nervous system, and most importantly, that the findings cannot be explained by other illnesses. Let's talk about the use of MRI in diagnosing MS and its value in following the course of the disease and response to treatment. The MRI scan uses magnetic and radio waves to look for changes in water content within the brain. No x-rays are involved. MRI cannot detect why the change occurred, when it occurred, or what the underlying tissue changes actually are. In other words, the changes seen on MRI are nonspecific to any particular disease. As a result, lesions seen on MRI can occur with illnesses as different as high blood pressure, normal aging, migraine, stroke, infections, tumors, and of course MS. However, there are certain types and locations of lesions that are very suggestive of MS, and their presence would support such a diagnosis. It is important to remember that there is only weak correlation between the changes seen on MRI and the degree of difficulty a person with MS is having. What is more important is where the lesions are located and whether they are especially destructive. After we have diagnosed a person with MS, the MRI becomes a valuable tool for monitoring the effect of treatment on their disease. Indeed, in our clinic, we perform MRIs of the head and often the spinal cord on a regular basis to follow the effects of an individual's treatment and, if appropriate, modulate or change their therapy. Today, MS is not a big part of my life. But when I was first diagnosed, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I think most people would have expected me to say that I wish I didn't have MS, but that's not true. Having this disease has made me feel grateful for things that I might have taken for granted before. It's also made me stronger and capable of putting smaller challenges in perspective. There are three general categories of treatment for MS. One is for treating the acute attack or relapse. Two involves symptom management. And three utilizes immune modulating therapies that affect the long-term course of the disease. Since attacks of MS are the result of acute inflammation of the central nervous system, Initial treatment is aimed at reducing the amount of inflammation, shortening the duration of the episode, and promoting healing. To do this, steroids, a powerful class of anti-inflammatory drugs, are administered. 
Steroids can be given either by mouth or by vein. The amount of drug given and the duration of treatment will vary with the severity of the attack and the response in the patient. Responses may not occur immediately, and delays in seeing benefit from these drugs is fairly common. While steroids have been shown to have an effect on the short-term course of MS, the value of their long-term use still remains controversial. There are many difficulties persons with MS may experience. These include muscle tightness or spasticity, overwhelming fatigue, bowel and bladder changes, tremors, and changes in mood, especially depression. There are no cures for many of these difficulties. There are a multitude of treatments in the form of medications, devices, and therapies that can decrease symptoms to a significant extent allowing a person with MS to function at their highest level. A survey of neurologists indicated that management of symptoms is often overlooked or not fully explored. Discussing symptom management with your neurologist is a vital part of your treatment and should not be overlooked in the rush to treat with disease-modifying drugs. Among the most important areas of symptom management is exercise and maintaining good physical condition. In my experience, the results of regular exercise can be quite impressive, with major reductions in fatigue, better mood, and greater ability to function within the limits imposed by one's MS. There is no one set or kind of exercise that persons with MS should do. Use common sense and gear any exercise program to your abilities. I urge you to avoid overheating, dehydration, and overdoing it. Indeed, my motto is, when you think you can do more, stop. I'm sure that many of you may be thinking, he's out of his mind. How can I exercise when I'm so tired, so weak, so busy, so stressed out? And you're right. You are fatigued, weak, busy, and stressed, but it's exactly these difficulties that regular exercise can address. Why fight both MS and being deconditioned? Start somewhere, keep it simple, and do it regularly. Free weights, exercise machines, push-ups, taking a walk, anything to tone muscles and keep you limber is going to help. To paraphrase a well-known saying, just say yes to exercise and you'll be pleasantly surprised. There are treatments for many of the physical and emotional symptoms of MS. The disease clearly will take what you give it, and the key, of course, is to give it as little as possible. Stay involved. With the support of family and friends and the broader community, the disease can be managed and a very fulfilling life is possible. In the last 20 years, there have been profound advances in the treatment of persons with MS especially those with the most common type of MS called relapsing remitting MS. The reason for this is that in this form of MS, in which there is a rapid and even sudden appearance of new neurologic symptoms, there is a great deal of new and active inflammation in the brain and spinal cord. And these new treatments are most effective at reducing acute inflammation. In the other forms of MS called primary progressive or secondary progressive MS, acute or active inflammation is either absent or present to a very small degree. All the treatments we will be discussing are not cures, but they have an effect in reducing relapses, in reducing the severity of attacks, and decreasing numbers of new lesions on MRI. There are two categories of drugs that change the landscape of MS treatment. They are the beta interferons and the drug Copaxone. Since their introduction, these drugs have been the foundation for the treatment of persons with relapsing MS. They have a well-established and acceptable safety profile and have long-term effectiveness. Because of these benefits, these drugs remain the foundation of my initial treatment for persons with relapsing remitting MS. There are five different formulations of the beta interferons 
Avanex, Pledger D, Beta Ceron, Extavia, and Rebif. They differ in their dosages and the frequencies of injection. All can cause flu-like symptoms that usually resolve over time, and blood work is needed to monitor for possible effects on blood, liver, and thyroid. There are multiple proposed mechanisms of action for the beta interferons, but all involve reducing the intensity of brain inflammation. Glatyrimer acetate, known by the brand name Copaxone and generically by Glatopa, are composed of long chains of four amino acids found in a brain protein. The mechanism of action of these drugs is not known, but they do not cause immune suppression, nor do they cause flu-like symptoms, and there is no need for blood monitoring. However, skin reactions can occur at injection sites, and some can be severe. Each of these two categories of drugs has their advantages and disadvantages, but both categories do not suppress the immune system. Instead, they modulate it and change its pattern of reaction to brain proteins. The concept of immune modulation is important, as many of the newer drugs I will be discussing suppress the immune system rather than modulate it. Unfortunately, both the beta interferons and copaxone must be administered by shots or injections, some under the skin and others into muscle. This has been an obstacle for some persons with MS, but given the proven effectiveness of these drugs, an overwhelming majority of persons have overcome their reluctance. Another newer, very different injectable drug is Zinbrita, an antibody that suppresses certain immune cells. It too is injected under the skin once per month, and it too can cause significant skin reactions, with a need to periodically monitor blood for toxicity. Three oral disease-modifying therapies are available for the treatment of relapsing MS. They are Gelenia, Abagio, and Tecfidera. They are pills taken daily and all have a suppressive effect on immune function. Their mechanism of actions are very different and monitoring for drug toxicity is needed with all these medications. Heart rhythm changes must also be monitored with use of Gelenia. Though a rare occurrence, two of the drugs, Gelenia and Tecfidera, have been associated with a serious brain infection called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or PML. PML is caused by the JC virus, present in about one half of the population. Persons can be tested for prior exposure to this virus with a blood test looking for antibodies. If levels of antibody are high, risks of PML are increased. Another very important and powerful drug for the treatment of relapsing MS is Tisabri. This is an antibody that reacts with immune cells and prevents them from entering the brain. It is administered by vein every month in a certified infusion center. The drug is well tolerated, but is also associated with a risk of developing PML, especially after treatment with the drug for more than two years. Monitoring for levels of JC virus antibodies is therefore essential, both prior to and during therapy. If antibody levels are high, avoiding or stopping the drug is necessary. Monitoring for liver toxicity while on Tisabri is also needed. A new addition to the MS treatment arsenal is the powerful new monoclonal antibody Ocrelizumab. It is FDA approved for treatment of relapsing forms of MS and is the first FDA approved drug for the treatment of primary progressive MS. The drug is administered by vein every six months and overall is well tolerated. Persons can become allergic to the drug and since it alters a person's immune system, there is a small increased risk of infection and possibly tumors. To date, there have been no reported cases of brain infection with the JC virus. Another monoclonal antibody is alemtuzumab, or Lemtrada. 
It is approved for the treatment of severe relapsing forms of MS that hadn't responded to other therapies. It is administered by vein once per year and essentially eliminates most of a person's immune system. It is effective in reducing relapses, but has many potential side effects, limiting its use and requiring close monitoring for extended periods of time following infusion. I'm often asked, Doc, what is the best drug for me? That is a question I cannot answer. MS is such a variable disease with probably different pathways in different individuals that I cannot predict which of the treatment options is best. Since individual responses vary considerably, I advise my patients to choose a drug they feel they can take consistently based upon side effects, the frequency of injection, and routes of injection. I follow my patients carefully, and if after nine to 12 months there is a stabilization of their illness, the therapy with that drug is continued. If not, I suggest a change to another drug in a different category. The development of gene sequencing and mapping of the human genome caused many people to believe that there would soon be cures for diseases, including MS. Alas, that was not to be. However, great strides have been made in our knowledge of gene function in MS, involving many aspects of the disease. There clearly is a genetic susceptibility for MS. Indeed, risks of developing this illness are much higher in siblings than in unrelated individuals, and even higher in identical twins. However, even in identical twins, the risk is only about 25%, indicating that not even genetic identity is sufficient to develop MS. We do know that certain genes, especially those involved in immune function, increase the risk of developing MS. But on the other hand, there also are genes that reduce the risk of developing MS, so-called resistance genes. Thus, since there is no single MS susceptibility gene, the net risk of developing MS is the result of a complex interaction of both susceptibility and resistance genes, as well as environmental factors. Environmental factors are a key component in determining susceptibility to MS. The incidence of MS has risen dramatically in the past 100 years, much more than can be explained just on the basis of better diagnosing the illness. This increase has occurred mainly among women, suggesting that environmental factors perhaps expose you to infectious agents such as viruses in combination with one's genes determine the development of the disease. Among the viruses implicated in the development of MS is the virus causing infectious mononucleosis. It is called the Epstein-Barr virus. It is a very common virus and its exact role in causing MS is not known at this time. However, there is a lot of research being done to better define this potentially important clue to the cause of MS. It is known that MS is more common the further one gets from the equator. This observation has raised the possibility that exposure to sunlight and vitamin D may have a role to play in MS. Indeed, there have been studies showing that low vitamin D levels are associated with an increased risk of disease. There are more recent studies suggesting that raising the blood levels of vitamin D with over-the-counter supplements may reduce the numbers of attacks. However, these findings are very preliminary, and much more work needs to be done to establish this with certainty. There is one thing that has been established, and that is that smoking can increase the severity of MS. Even exposure to secondhand smoke early in life can have this effect. This effect is even more pronounced in persons having particular MS susceptibility genes. Hopefully, these data will provide an even stronger incentive for persons with MS not to smoke or be exposed to persons that do. Since I found out I had MS, I've given birth to two wonderful children, pursued a challenging career, wrote a book, have a happy family life, and made many friends. I made the decision to continue living my life despite MS. You can too. Don't be ignorant about this disease. Read up on it. Know your limitations and work with it. 
It is not a death sentence. It is just a challenge that you can overcome. For all those living with MS, I want to share with you some simple steps that have been most effective in dealing with your illness. Number one, start drug treatment early. Number two, maintain a good healthy diet. Number three, use supplemental vitamins sparingly. Number four, make exercise a priority in your life. And most importantly, please work closely with your doctor.